Thank you very much and welcome to uh, this uh, talk between uh, Hani Kamali and Santiago Mostin titled The White Elephant in the Room, Public Art and National Identity. And uh, my name is Yamila and I represent Plattform Kose Syd, which is a new artist-run platform for public art in the south of Sweden. So I first want to thank Malmö Konsthall for this opportunity to, um, to help us uh, arrange a space for this event. And uh, Plattform Kose Syd will, or we actually have already set up office uh, at Konstfremjandet at Östergatan in Malmö. And uh, there we have an exhibition at the moment with, uh, about the processes surrounding public art. And um, from there we will, will continue working with uh, improving the working conditions for uh, artists working with uh, art in public. And um, we will also strive to broaden the commissioning of public art. And not only that, we also want to be a platform for the discussions surrounding public art and uh, the meaning of art in public. And that's why we are here today. Um, and before I introduce you guys, I just want to remind everybody that this uh, event is live streamed. So there's a camera in the back. So please don't move in front of it if you can avoid it. And um, I also want to remind you that the, the next event that we do as a collaboration with Malmö Konsthall with Jonna Bornemark next week is fully booked. But that event will also be live streamed. So if you have not booked, you can see it online. Uh, so yeah, I'm very happy to introduce Hanni Kamali and Santiago Mostin. Uh, Hanni Kamali is an artist based in Malmö, or sort of, sort of based in Malmö. Not anymore. <laughs> Moving around. <laughs> Moving around. Uh, but she's currently presenting Markings, a series of discursive walks in Malmö, which is arranged uh, by Moderna Museet. And in her performative walks, Kamali traces how shifting ideologies and power relations have shaped the city of Malmö. Santiago Mostin is an artist based in Stockholm who works with film, installations and performances that test the divide between disparate cultural spheres, employing an intuitive process to engage with a knowledge and history grounded equally in the body and the rational mind. And today they will talk about the conflict between national identity and artistic repre representation, both locally and from an international perspective. So we are very happy to have you here. Um, so I'm giving the word to you guys. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thanks for the introduction, Jamila, and thanks to everyone for coming. Thank you also for your um, patience in terms of having this in English. I would try to do this in Swedish, but uh, I don't think I'm quite at that point yet. Um, uh, it's ex exciting to come down to Malmö and to have this conversation with Hani, who is someone that I have or, sort of been in conversation with and also worked with in different ways uh, or shown together with over the last couple of years. And this uh, is a conversation, so we have prepared thoughts and slides, but I think we're just going to try and organically sort of move back and forth between them as we think about our roles as, um, you know, make, uh, operators within the cultural field and people who sort of are given this expectation occasionally to present things in a realm in which there are many different uh, cultural and social factors involved. And that's, I suppose, highlighted more than anywhere in the public space. Um, so I will start by handing over to Hani. Yeah, so as uh, Jamila mentioned, I've done this series of discursive walks and I worked with a project that is in Malmö and is about spaces and sculptures in Malmö that have this kind of, um, um, I would say, problem with representation and a colonial past that is quite obvious in, in, in their 
um, presentation. And this sculpture is at Stortorget yet um, in Malmö and is made by Stig Blomberg, a Swedish sculptor, who has these kind of um, racial images in his works, both here in Malmö and in, in Stockholm as well, at Tea Central. And um, recently, or oh, yeah, I, th I just think um, it's such an obvious example of this type of um, imagery that exists within um, within our public spaces, in our public spaces, and that we also don't regard or disregard, and we don't um, see them, basically. Um, or what I'm surprised by is that most people don't even notice it. Um, and I think public art has this kind of um, role in within the public that it has, um, it, it has an impact, uh, whether we see it or not. Um, and Stig Blomberg, as you have, we also have here. We, uh, uh, you want to say something? Go ahead. Stig Blomberg also has this. This is like his depictions of, of Nordic people. And this is Asken Embla in Sölvesborg. And then again, you have this kind of, and every, every time you see an article about SD and Sölvesborg, this is like the image that they would show. Um, and this is, you know, clearly uh, the way that public art works is as a, in a representational way. Yeah, I mean, uh, to me, this is something which is quite obvious, but also quite invisible. I think very often many of us walk through squares without noticing the sculptures that have been put there and without thinking about the, um, you know, the times at which they were made. Um, and just showing two different sculptural works by the same um, sculptor mm -hmm. shows also, you the different ways that uh, a body might be perceived and also presented in a space. And this is something that maybe we're not confronted with on a daily basis, but uh, is, you know, this is indicative of how built in it is in the sort of uh, public imagination, imagination, let's say. Exactly, and it's kind of building of cities and building of Sweden um, alongside the art, because public art has always been part of that, like creating monuments, um, has a history from like the monarchy, uh, following then industrialization and the growth and increase of public sculpture during that time until now. We have come to see it as a part of our society and an important part of our society. Um, it is this democratic way of presenting art. But then again, it has this kind of um, um, heritage and, and also as, art, uh, as artists, we sort of have like this kind of responsibility. We're complicit in this, in this field, as you said in the introduction, we operate um, in this same s sphere. Could you talk a bit about uh, neutrality? Because we've all, we've, the two of us have been discussing about um, public space and the role of, uh, you know, the government or government institutions in producing public art. I have uh, made work with Staten's Construed here in Malmö. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, yeah, where do you, what do you see, do you think there is such a thing as neutrality in public space? No, I think there's, there's this idea that all public art should be neutral, but I don't think it's, it, I think it's impossible for it to be neutral because public space is always political. Um, as soon as you step outside, it is political. And for some, it might be um, not, like you might not be aware of it, but as long as you're of a, a non-cisgendered, non-white body, you would notice it, um, the polit political aspects of it. And to then, uh, assume or say that all public art should be neutral in that sense becomes paradoxical to mm. to what it actually is. Um, and there is no sort of innocence within that. And yeah. So I guess the, the next question is not for you necessarily, but just uh, theory, hypothetically is what to do with this if we, you know, Except that they can't, that we here try for neutrality, but there can't necessarily be such a thing. Mm. You know, how to make use of the space 
uh, that we all operate in and mm. how to exactly yeah how to stretch the bounds of it how to how to change the way that it's perceived or change people's sort of awareness of certain things yeah. that uh, take place within the society yeah and I think um, part of your practice you've worked with that in the sort of um, expanding those yeah, boundaries. I've tried. We have a couple of images here from uh, this work, which was commissioned by Starton's Konstrad, um, called uh, Repetitionen, or the Repetition, where I stood in front of Axel Eber's uh, Albert Zitz Era, era uh, sculpture on one end of on one end of the square, and it was a temporary work. It was a performance, but it was something that was done sort of on a, on a Friday or Saturday evening, so a very busy time in the square. And the work, <laughs> we, put the we put the two slides together to show the difference in sort of heroic poses between, <laughs> between then and now. Uh, but, but, but I mean, I was thinking, uh, trying to think by producing this work of the um, transition that one goes through when you come to terms with the place where you live but you're not from. Um, the work in itself was quite straightforward in its, in its um, execution. What it was is that I went on stage with uh, two professional musicians and I had the text of the national song, the national anthem written down on a, on a sheet of paper and I didn't know the words to the song. Um, and when I decided to do the work, I deliberately didn't read it, but I got on stage and I, as they played music, I sung the national anthem, uh, top to bottom. And then, um, I guess what the work was, was I, was I sang the song until I knew it by heart. So in this like transition of time between beginning and coming to an end, uh, it took me about half an hour where I could sort of like take all the words in and sing them all without looking at the text. But it was extremely kind of like awkward and embarrassing. I mean, this is one of these kind of nightmare situations where you're on stage and you don't know the words. Um, but uh, yeah, it's there's something about being in a new culture, being a foreigner, you always kind of perceive yourself on, sa on stage in a way. It's not necessarily something romantic or fantastical, but it can be kind of like banal everyday situations. And so I just tried to represent this shift from having lived elsewhere to, to sort of calling this place my home by um, memorizing in real time in front of an audience the, the, the national anthem, you know, the, the national song and everything that people attach to that in terms of meaning. So it's, it's terrible to watch. I'm not a good singer, uh, but, uh, but uh, it was, yeah, I don't know, it was something. Mm. We've spoken as well about another sort of... Yeah, because this project was done with, in Sweden, right? Which one? This one? No, with the public art agency, right? Yeah, that was in, this was in Malmö, Malmö yeah. story, yeah. yeah. Um, just the public art agency. Yeah. Yeah, we've been talking about um, public art now, and this piece is in Uppsala, at SLU, the University of Agriculture in Uppsala, and has been reactivated um, sort of in this year, because they had this piece for a long time um, at the university, and then they had visitors um, from university in, in, um, in Ethiopia, I think, who reacted towards the artwork um, and said it was um, racist and colonial. And so um, the university didn't know if they should remove it or not and decided to keep it. Um, and with the consultation by a public art agency in Sweden, they decided to then complement the work with a contemporary artwork that you can't see here, but it's placed like right in front of it, sort of, um, which is a root of a tree or some roots, and instead of addressing the actual problems of it, they talk about it as if it's nature. Um, so the whole um, discourse around it, that's, um, it's turned and shifted to being about ecology and nature, instead of actually addressing 
the problems within the piece. Um, yeah, I mean, the issue here, I feel, is that there's a, a work which is, has been made and which is in public space, which is problematic, and then a long kind of discussion takes place, and in the end, the work still exists, it still has the same affect, but uh, the, the um, response to it uh, being that we can complement this and sort of think about it differently by putting something else next to it, I think doesn't quite work. We have a couple of curious, interesting quotes here from this, for example, from the pro-rector of uh, SLU. She says, "They are in fin construct for all set men before problem ne vi har internationella gäster, inte minst från Afrika. De reagerar negativt och får en dålig bild av SLU." And, and I then, think, yeah. <laughs> sorry. Oh, should I read this one? Sure. And then, so, so the, the work that was placed uh, in concert with this work was called Vext. And uh, the official text on it says, Konstverken Vext och Jungel Wagner skildrar växter och ekosystem, vilket många av våra studenter här på Ultuna och andra SLU ort studerar. När det är som tuffast i tenta perioden kan studenter behöva titta upp från kursböckerna och vila ögonen på något annat. Yeah, and it's it, they've said it's like a cultural treasure, and it, and they wanted to keep it uh, in that sense, and and um, even the public art agency sort of defends it with um, saying that they have researchers at the institute that also have like interpreted the artwork in this natural side. But I think it's like symptomatic of the attitude towards towards public art or art, or in like somatic, symptomatic of a Swedish um, uh, way of dealing with it. Just, you still have it, but you're gonna frame it differently. Um, and you view it as, oh, our image shouldn't be tainted, which is basically what she says, or people get this wrong impression. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, it's interesting to, to to talk and think about image in that sense and perception. I mean, I, I also, I don't, for my own sake, I don't mean to sort of like poke fun at Starton's construct. I mean, I think they are working within a certain framework within which they themselves, and I think many other actors in the Swedish uh, art scene, they don't have access to different ways of seeing, you know, their own history, I suppose. And um, it's all a process. I think discussions like this, hopefully, uh, uh, help a bit and, and other ways of shifting the ones who are sort of looking at public work, public artworks can also help that process. Um, but it is, yeah, it is something where a discussion can't begin and end and then you're left with the same artifacts of oppression in space where there are, you know, they always, they have been for many years, but there are uh, different types of people who react uh, negatively to these depictions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, they have other students, new students, and yeah. It is. I mean, it's a question of public imagination in a yeah. way, um, and we can show here a short clip from Hani's video, Head, Hand, Eye, which was shown at uh, Moderna Museet in 2018 and elsewhere. <laughs> Heads, as repeating through history, the severed heads 
There have been horror films and comedies, cartoons, high art, and the beheading of Paul Turner by Jews, or Anne Boleyn. Decapitation, as ancient as it seems, can be dated back to the Roman times, where the removal of the head, the caput, was seen as a removal of an order, replaced with a new order. The Latin word for head, meaning the vital part, life, leader, or chief. The Roman sculptures were useful propaganda tools. They represented the new leader, the glorified emperor. Old emperors would be replaced with new emperors, and the heads would be reused and recarved. The body was left intact. And if in hindsight, they were perceived as bad emperors, destructive and condemned, their portraits were removed or destroyed, their names would be erased. Sometimes the sculpture itself was assaulted, a symbolic act. So what's, what's our relationship here to these types of uh, contemporary histories which are being written um, all around the world? Um, I've, I've not found much solidarity or sort of a response or a real, real change in what I've seen where I live. Um, but for me, it, it, it becomes quite emblematic of the relationship that uh, I guess Swedish culture has to these histories, um, which I think needs to be uh, brought up a little bit. I, this, this, is a, this is a shackle which is used to bind the hands of a slave who is, or not slave, an enslaved person who has been taken from, from the West African coast to the New World. Um, Sweden was one of the, during Baroque Europe era, Sweden was one of the major exporters of iron to the British who traded the iron with uh, the slave traders on the west coast of Africa. And so there's this relationship whereby um, Swedish merchants were directly, you know, um, implicated in the slave trade, in, in the fact that they were making a huge profit from it. Um, and were providing li the literal material that was used to bind the uh, enslaved peoples who were being taken to the New World. But there is, because it's one step removed, there isn't a kind of, there isn't a, a need for, uh, for a kind of, you know, present day coming to terms with this history in the way, in the, in a, the way that it would, that is needed in other countries, other European former colonial powers. Um, I see a relationship or a continuation of this type of relationship in the way that Swedish iron is also exported and used to produce weapons which are dropped on uh, countries, countries around the world where uh, you know, populations are, are suffering. And so you know, this, this fact that there's one step back almost reminds me of the, the difference between how a white-collar criminal, someone who sort of commits crime on, on Wall Street is treated versus a criminal, someone who's found with a pocket full of drugs is treated on the street, you know, that we, it's, it's, it's a much different process and it's not something which is acknowledged or not something which is seen as being um, as, you know, as evil, let's say, because it's so much more insidious, it's so much more like built in and, and kind of accepted and clean. Um, and yeah, it's, an, it's, it's a different way of, I mean, f it's a way of thinking or hopefully trying to problematize national identity, you know, that this, this, is, this is ours. This comes from, our, from Sweden's minds. <laughs> I, 
think it runs quite deep as well because it comes, you know, from the mining, from the colonization of north of Sweden and then goes so far. It runs deep and, and has all these um, connections, the trade routes. Yeah. I guess another thing which is uh, quite interesting to point out is that I guess this, this idea of national identity is much more... Um, it's, it's not that old, you know? I, I feel like it's a mid to late 18th century movement which created these uh, mental sort of identities that are, that create, that are created uh, or that exist still um, around the world. But reading about the ways that uh, merchants from all sorts of different uh, countries within what is now Europe were profiting from the slave trade and were sort of engaged in uh, plantation economies in the new world. You understand that it wasn't, even if, even if we can look in the history books and it says this was a British colony, this was a Dutch colony, this was Swedish. The, the people who were in fact on those islands or in, in those parts of the world who were profiting from the slave, uh, from slave economies, slave-based economies, were Swedish and Dutch and Latvian and German and sort of like trading with each other and uh, not, not existing within these fixed uh, conceptions of identity that we assume now. You know, borders are fluid, but we don't realize that they are, and they were much more fluid at a certain point in time, which was not that far removed from where we are today. Yeah, so <laughs> um, I kind of work with the idea of monuments uh, within my sculptures as well, because I consider them monuments for victims of state violence. Um, they're also made of metal, so they have these, um, yeah. And instead of having these um, monument for heroes, here they're the opposite, so they're for um, the oppressed and as well as being kind of um, in this world of fragility and movement. So they're named after people or persons, specific persons. This is Crutcher, named after Terence Crutcher. Um, who was killed by a policeman. Um, and yeah, this is Jordan, from Jordan Edwards. So there's sort of um, memorials and monuments, but kind of um, um, working with the idea of like national heroism as being something different, as being something else. Um, but also working with a, a material that is very, has this sort of image of being strength and heroic as well. And then also working with what is a size and what is a body uh, within monuments, I would say. Mm. Yeah, this, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, an, it's, a, it's a mirror, isn't it? Uh, a monument and a memorial. Monuments were es established as memorials to heroes, but um, it's, I think, an important uh, shift or an important sort of swing in the, op the opposite direction to memorialize those who were not the heroes of these uh, history lines which have been given to us, which we are starting to understand are false or uncomplicated in a way which um, doesn't give space for us to kind of like live and breathe in, a, in you know, with, with, within the stories that we have of our own lives, basically. Yeah, it doesn't correspond or doesn't, mm, it speaks of a, a, of a victory or, or some sort of like upper hand. Um, that doesn't consider all aspects of, of lives or all lives or um, especially the ones that are not, like who do we not remember? 
who who deserves to be memorialized or who and it's usually not um, the ones that are memorialized uh, in a way uh, what is forgotten in different histories and stories that we tell in, in, in the public space as well and that we know of as part of our own history. I mean, it's there in the word itself, his story, mm. you know, so we know who they're talking about and it's, it's not us, basically. Um, this is another public work which was, which was in Molawang's in Molawang's Tori as well in 2016, Mira Akel. It's not, uh, it, it's maybe not as directly related to national identity, in this sense. But when I was asked to to do this commission for Staten's Construed, I wanted to do the performance work. But then I also thought it could be nice to. I was thinking about like what the sort of cliche or stereotypical criteria are of public artwork, which is that it has to be large, it has to be monumental in a sense. And I wanted to make something which was of that scale, but in terms of its reading, was something which was quite a lot more ambiguous or like deliberately ambiguous. So this is a, an almost tongue in cheek, very simple depiction of this word, which is one of the oldest words still existing in in European languages, it's sort of like a proto-Indo-European source from, the, from the, the word to smile, which is mirakel. And it was installed on the square so that you did look up at it and have a backdrop of the sky shifting. And so, I mean, I felt about it that it was kind of like a litmus test for how one related oneself to the society that was around you. you can, you can look around Molabang's story and see all the, the commerce and all the trade and all the different you know, activity which is happening there. Or you can, if, if you're so inclined, you can think about the heavens and spirituality and things like that. Or it could be just seen as a big sort of like, fuck you to you know, anybody who thinks that this actually is, um, that, that there is value, that there is such a thing as a Swedish miracle, let's say economically speaking and culturally speaking. Um, but uh, yeah, and I mean, so it was, it was something where I had a mixed set of relations towards this feeling and towards this word and wanted to present it in a space where I, where others would also sort of like relate to it differently. You know, it's one way to think about artworks is that as the person who's, who's making a work, you obviously have a direct line, a direct relationship to it. But I always see myself as um, almost like an, an employee or a sort of subordinate, subordinate of the work that's being made. Like, it, it tells me what I need to do in order to make it what it needs to be, basically. So I'm working for it. I'm not sort of like imposing my, my uh, yeah, like my, or, uh, my authority over it in a sense. But by making something with that kind of relationship, um, the hope is that other people will also develop their own relationships to uh, that particular work. So it's something which you know, can exist uh, um, and have different responses come out of different people depending on what your spiritual or political background is. I also think about language mm. um, in terms of, oh, also the square, but also the singing, that there is a sort of um, relationship to, to language as well within your work and within these works, I mean. Yeah, that's true. Um, I do think it's a miracle that people don't just, on a more regular basis, turn their car around and start driving into, in, into traffic in the wrong direction. Like, how is it possible that no, that <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm crazy. Right? No. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, just, just if you stop and think of the fact that we are all over the world, millions of people who, who have gathered in these urban centers over the course of the 20th century and, and now into this century, and you know, on a, on, a, on a subway train in the morning, one person blocking a doorway could put 
tens of thousands out of uh, you know out of sync with their with their routines. And there's something to be said for human nature in the fact that this just doesn't happen more often than it does. And you can see how it's how uh, potent it is when it when it is weaponized by religious extremists. You know these these everyday objects which become weapons: trucks, cars, airplanes. Um, so that's my, I mean, that's my relationship to it. I, I guess I have a, a not a sort of sincere relationship to the word, I suppose, rather than a cynical one, but I think that's also maybe a, a, a kind of something I wanted to test within myself and also within public space. Mm -hmm. I wanted to show as well <clears throat> A monument which is not anywhere close to Sweden. This is uh, on the island of Tobago. And this is a monument um, which was built in 1978 by a Latvian sculptor named Janis Mintix. And he built it to uh, commemorate the uh, Latvian or Koronian presence on the island of Tobago. Um, this is a short video that I, video clip that I filmed of it. Um, it's a basic, straightforward, uh, modernist monument. But what it's commemorating is something which is quite... Uh, it's, it's what I mentioned a little bit earlier, but it's quite uh, peculiar, which is that um, there was, on the island of Tobago and also in, in other parts of the New World, um, communities of Europeans which were multicultural, which um, traded with one another and existed before the advent of slave-based uh, plantation sugar economies in the Caribbean. Um, there's a sign next to this monument, and part of the sign, it says, under the benevolent rule of the Dukes of Courland in Latvia, the Germans, Latvians, Scandinavians, Dutch, British, French, Jews, Caribs, Caribs were the uh, uh, indigenous population from the Venezuelan coast who uh, moved on to Trinidad. And Gambians formed an international settlement of free men at Great Colon Bay, where this uh, monument is. They engaged in trade with North America, Brazil, Europe, and Africa. Other Caronian settlements were located at Black Rock, Mount Irvin, King Bay, and Castara. So these, so, I guess for me it was quite powerful to realize that this uh, narrative that we've been given about um, the relationship to the Caribbean and you know the colonial relationship to the New World, um, beginning with the advent of sugarcane, sugarcane plantation and slavery, was not necessarily the case. This colony that's that's being that this is being that's being commemorated here. Um, existed from the 1630s through the sort of 1670s, so for about 50 years. And then the island went fallow, and then the uh, British colonial um, powers took over and began plantation economy on the island. Um, but it's, it's a way to think about, again, the fact that this idea of national identity is something which has has been become mixed and complicated, not just in the last 20, 30 years with the um, you know, immigration of different types of people to Sweden, but Swedes were part of multicultural communities in the new world in the 17th century. You know? So this is something which is ongoing and that kind of identity that is, is given to us, which is which, in which the lines are more, more clearly drawn, I think is false. Yeah, we also talked about um, Axel Eriksson yeah. um, and how in, in, in the western parts of Africa uh, there were a lot of um, Swedish people, Danish people, um, Dutch, uh, Germans before the colonization, before actually colonies and countries as we know them now were established that operated as settlers and traders as well. Yeah, Axel Eriksson was an interesting figure. He was a cattle farmer and an elephant hunter who was born and raised in Benishbori, but uh, emigrated to Damaraland, which is now present-day Namibia in mm -hmm. southwest Africa. And 
was a outright colonialist. He was respo responsible for the um, the eradication of the elephant population in that part of, of Southwest Africa. Um, you know, employed um, Africans as as unpaid workers, all these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. But the most fascinating thing about him was was that he was a kind of amateur taxidermist and he hunted and and stuffed hundreds, maybe thousands yeah. of birds, which are now in the collection of the Venice Bordi uh, Museum. Yeah. Which like, is a very strange and, and oh, you know, b bizarre, like, l representation of this uh, relationship that this country has with, with that particular history, Southern Africa. Um, in the, sorry, this is, this was, he was active there in the late 19th century, so from the 1880s through to, I think he passed away. 1901. 1901, yeah. Yeah, and yeah, he's part of his bird collection, his public collection. Mm -hmm. So there's all these exchanges happening, you know. Um, mm. I've included this picture here, just to, to think a little bit about um, when, maybe to shift the perception of when these types of relationships ended or how they ended. So this is an image from uh, Hurricane Flora, which was a, one of the strongest hurricanes to ever hit the Caribbean. And it hit the island of Tobago, which, was, which is not in the usual path of the, the hurricanes, which come up through from the Atlantic into North America. But it hit in 1963. And so slavery was abolished in the British colonial empire between 1934 and 38. So emancipation was in 34, but then there was a period called amelioration, where the slaves were still required to, to work on the plantations, but um, at the end of that four-year period, they were allowed to sort of leave for good. Um, but the, the, ending of, the ending of slavery in the, in the British colonies was not the end of racialized capitalism. Um, I would, I would say that it happened maybe f for good when this hurricane took place. Um, because when Hurricane Flora hit Tobago, the winds were as high as 230 kilometers an hour. Um, crop plantations were abandoned. 50% of all uh, coconut trees and coconut plantations were felled to the ground. 75% of all the rainforest on the island was just destroyed. Um, you know, the majority of all the, the structures there. And because of this um, natural disaster, the, the economy of the island shifted permanently from agriculture to tourism. So the relationship uh, between the economic relationship, which was predicated on this sort of like uh, racialized uh, and slave-based economy, didn't really end with the end of slavery. It ended because of something which, which which just was so overwhelming and so um, destructive that it required the island to change and become something else, change its, its entire identity. I mean, it's, it's, it's related diagonally, I, I suppose, to the way that we are living in the world today when we, we are experiencing stronger and stronger storms, maybe not necessarily right here in Sweden, but around the world. And, and um, it's we're I mean, you know we're required we need to change the way that we that we operate basically. Yeah, going back to the public art. So this is a sculpture of Carl King Carl the Twelfth in Kungstegården in Stockholm, and um, we can go back to the the idea of neutrality within public art, which is how can you say that an image of a um, monarch is somehow political or not political. He's pointing towards Russia, so it's highlighting the wars between Sweden and Russia during that time when that king lived. Um, and this space or the sculpture itself has been or has functioned um, as a meeting point for neo-Nazis in Sweden. So this is where they would meet, because uh, he was 
a hero for Nazis. And so you have this kind of duality of um, like how does a public art piece function within our society? How does it operate and how, what, what do we do with them? I mean, we see it replicated all over the world and we've been seeing it you know, by the news media um, happening in the United States as well. This is the statue of Robert E. Lee, Confederate General um, in Richmond, Richmond, Virginia. And it again points to the question, or the, the shift of turning a, a monument into a memorial. So this is the same statue over this, over this past summer. James Baldwin talks about uh, remembering, so like reattaching, uh, you know, a member, meaning like a part of a, a limb, part of a body, or you know, or a concept, an idea, a self-identity, as as a way of kind of like putting a broken house together again. And um, you know, there's a lot that's being some spegla. There's a lot that's being um, you know reflected and 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 uh, put on top of these these objects which exist in space, which can be taken for granted for so long, but then can stand for so much, which is unacknowledged until it's, you know, time to think about them differently. Mm. I, yeah, and this question has been become more and more relevant um, right now, but as I want to show in my video, for example, is that a history of removing monuments has existed since the Roman times, but at the same time, as that we should perhaps uh, the culture around monuments or the thinking um, of like them as memories, as something that has commemorated in public, should shift towards something more, um, something else. Because I think this is really powerful, powerful versus the public, uh, the public hero of the of the colonist on a horse which is what we have now. We have a, a 3D representation of it here as well. Um, and for this video, can we just cut the sound off? Oh, it's cut, sorry, never mind. Raoul Peck, who's the director of I'm, I'm Not Your Negro, the documentary about James Baldwin, was writing uh, in the aftermath of these protests in the United States um, about James Baldwin's legacy. And he, he wrote, why can't we understand, as Baldwin did and demonstrated throughout his life, that racism is not a sickness nor a virus, but rather the ugly child of an economic system that produces inequalities and injustice. The history of racism is parallel to the history of capitalism. The law of the market, the battle for profit, the imbalance of power between those who have all and those who have nothing are part of the foundation of this macabre play, of this relationship. Um, and I mean, I th for me, that's, that, uh, that implicates all of us, the fact that we exist within a consumerist, capitalized, uh, capitalist society. You know, and so we all need to be thinking about what our relationships are to space and others in the, in, the, in the spaces that we share, I suppose. Yeah, there's another, um, it was a um, Senegalese political activist in the early 1920s who t talked about the same thing um, as imperialism and capitalism was basically, um, and colonialism are all intertwined and dependent on each other and capitalism has permeated our society in every aspect. And what we call imperialism or coloni colonism is basically imperialism. Imperialism is based on capital. We've got a, we've got a neat little diagram here <laughs> to sum it all up for you. <laughs> and I was thinking of something quite quickly like with public art, like beyond what we 
uh, there's also this idea of permanence. Something is there and it's there forever, which is something we didn't talk about right now. But Because um, you have the image, uh, the 3D scan, it has all these tags and graffiti on them, which is almost like a monument that plays with permanence. Like, is it, because it's something that all, is always removed, and then the idea of like having these monuments, we shouldn't remove them, they're, they're part of our history, public heritage. Um, this like outcry towards uh, the removal of um, specific monuments is also playing on this idea of permanence, that it's art is supposed to be permanent as well. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's very, it's a very culturally specific idea of permanence that exists in this part of the world. Because seeing a, a monument, a statue covered in graffiti and, and bringing it into the, into the present day, for me, reminds me of the type of permanence which exists in the Caribbean, for example, or the parts of Africa that I, that I, that I know. Um, which is that things like records and sort of, um, you know, things kept in archives, very well organized by in certain analytically simple structures don't exist. So it could be seen as there being chaos there. But the, fa the, the fact is that um, things are permanent in a different way. It's more that things are always being uh, kind of eroded and built up again and refreshed. Stories are always being retold and told and told again. You know, there's different types of annex anecdotes, different stories that you hear growing up, or I heard growing up in, in Trinidad, um, which, which are permanent in my mind as they are in the minds of the generations who have come after, you know. And these are, these are different ways of thinking about how, um, yeah, how history or how our stories are brought forward. Mm -hmm. And it's not new, obviously. I mean, this is the way that for generations, uh, you know, different types of traditional populations have, have continued and have very complex ways of thinking about um, space and history and time and things like that, but just not kept in this very European analytical way of doing like. things. The mat material and the object uh, becomes yeah. very um, the carrier of all these memories and and, mm -hmm. and the permanence. Uh, it's like the Malagan. It's like a anthropological object that has been collected in 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 different cultures in in uh, Papua New Guinea, I think, um, that are used as burial items. They carve them and then they throw them away in the sea, but were picked up by anthropologists and put in museums. Um, like objects that are not supposed to be. Uh, there are monuments and memorials at the same time in those cultures, but then they're placed in this kind of like, you're supposed to be an artifact that lasts forever. Um, and this idea of heritage also as a Western aspect, because how do you preserve a herit heritage? The idea of that preservation is a Western concept. Like there's different ways ways of preserving things. Yeah, exactly. Even the even the need to the, the need to preserve mm -hmm. in that way is not that that old of a of a tradition, I suppose. And how we we sort of think of all these values and and then they're supposed to be encapsulated within objects or within you know sculptures or things um, that are taken from different places i think which is a very capitalist way of thinking again it's all this commodif commodification of um, of memories of ideas of knowledges um, again and that sort of circulate um, as well. Should we open up a little yeah. bit? It was just a um,
Thank you both for your very powerful presentation. I want to go back to the video that you played, honey. Um, yeah. And uh, throughout the video, there's a lot of violence, so decapitation of heads and all of these things going on. But in the end, when the sculptures are taken down, there's this moment of release, so people start you know, celebrating. Um, so that sort of stayed with me, and then it made me think, um, do you think we should strive for that in Sweden? Um, and if so, in what ways do you imagine this to happen? Thanks. Um, I don't, I, I'm not going to say this is a, per, it's not, I don't have any perfect solutions for it, but I think definitely, like, we shouldn't fall into this idea of permanent cultural heritage, uh, not in these forms that we have them. Um, for example, I've been thinking a lot about Torgbrunnen, the sculpture at Stortorget, um, what should happen to that, and I think, like, um, you can, you can remove, you can remove the racial um, image. You can remove the body that is within that sculpture without actually um, removing anything else from the sculpture. It would still work, right? Like it's supposed to be, uh, the sculpture is supposed to have um, certain symbolic elements that are attached to Sweden's history, but also the history of the square in Malmö. And those elements, those, those visual elements that are sort of like carvings and uh, reliefs and also this uh, boy that we see. Um, when we see them, just as citizens or people living in Malmö, do we register the meaning of those visual elements? Do we know them? Can we read them? And um, the connection of the boy then called the Murian, which has a specific connection to the square in Malmö, I don't think we get that from the sculpture. I think we could just, we can take that part away. That's my specific solution for, for that. Um, boy, especially. Um, other, I think, I think it's good to have the discussion. Like for example, when we show the Jungeln Wagner, uh, Gunnar Nylund, the one that is at SLU in Uppsala, uh, where they just, it just stay there despite the discussions. I don't think that is a fruitful uh, way of ending that discussion. I don't know what to do with them, like specifically, but I don't think uh, the solution is to complement it, or the solution is talk by talking about nature, like without addressing it. I think we have to acknowledge the problems that we have within uh, our history and 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 within visual art. Um, it's a has been and is a problematic field. The cultural world has always supported um, specific ideologies and not necessarily good ideologies. So I think it has to be addressed at least. And it can't be like concealed within a new theme, basically. I mean, I think one obvious uh, response or one obvious way to deal with it, you know, in the, in the case of this uh, Gunnar Nieland sculpture, for example, is to look at its structural. It's to look at who it is who's having these discussions. So Staten's Construed can publish a, a, a long page on their website about all the deep, long discussions they had about uh, what this work is and, and how to deal with it. But who, what is that group of people at Staten's Construed who is having that discussion? And who do they represent? Exactly. So I think if you look at, at the structures, you know, the power structures within the cultural sector and start to try and address that and sort of like shift, shift uh, the, the, um, the types of people who are in there or the, the sort of types of um, expertise who have access to these decisions, then I think you start to see, you will start to see um, work which which reflects that shift and also which reflects more accurately the society that we live in and the time that we live in, rather than what many institutions in the cultural sector are now, in Sweden at least, which is um, something in terms of, they, they, they more work in terms of sort of like maintaining a heritage in a sense, or like not being quite delicate which, with what is already there, reconsidering it, but not really ruffling too many feathers at the same time. 
And I think that those kind of like experts and, and organizations around what's being chosen within our spaces, public spaces basically, the decisions that are made that are not ours basically. Uh, that's where a lot of um, the thinking or the analyzing or restructuring needs to be done because I think those sculptures are um, Torgvin was placed there in 1964. Um, Gunnar Nylund came to, to the university in the 60s as well, but I think we're still maintaining some sort of neutrality within, within public art um, that is based on this kind of um, idea of what public art should be and the idea of Sweden, basically, what is a dem democratic country that still kind of falls apart um, with, with the public arts that are shown because we're still reproducing the same ideas. We're still doing the same things, even with public art that is put up now, I would say. Like there is still this idea of what it should be and who it should be made by. So public art is supposed to promote Swedish artists. Um, public art is supposed to be politically neutral. Um, already um, says who makes the art and how it looks like and who makes the decisions. Um, it still shows um, the inherently problematic parts of that structure. And it is optim like it's a political decision. Like, and and, and what, what is kind of worrying, I think it's, it's always the right and the liberals and the conservative and the old rights that are speaking about public art in this very animated way and removing things. So the, in Yadfala, they removed a painting um, because they, it's called the Red Star and it's a, like Marx, uh, there's a person reading Marx, I think it was, in that painting, so they removed it from the city hall. Um, and it was the moderates that did it, so it's again, you know, this discussion, what, where is it happening? And... Yeah, it was actually just the, the, the book Kapitalet, Capital, which was seen, understood as undemocratic, and therefore it could not be in a commune house according to this speaker, who also censored a red uh, starfish, which, which was also too communist, according to her. So, but thanks to both of you for the talk. And I wanted to um, ask, uh, Santiago, you were at one point speaking about uh, public imaginary or public imagination. And I think that notion is interesting in, 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 at the point when I think what you were doing with your extended montage presentation was to sort of avoid this binary of good or bad or like how, as these kind of public art works have functioned and still are and I found it interesting in the way that the Gunnar Nylund, uh, when you were shifting between the two of his works it was quite obvious and perhaps historically like I don't know um, in the beginning of last the last century that would the two of those sculptures would consciously be on the same square because uh, people should sort of get that connotation. But today it seems normal and uh, neutral to have them far away enough to, for that, so that we don't make that connection. So that that kind of understanding of, like that there is almost like a, a montage in the public space to sort of sometimes not make, give us this information as it feels like you, so I was thinking if you could say something about how um, uh, the, of course it's public artists or art in the public space is creating certain public imaginaries, but it's also disabling other kind of public imaginaries. It's almost like um, setting up thresholds for certain connections that we are supposed to make or to not make, which is the case of Gunnar Nylund in this century, let's say. 
because we are not supposed to make that connection, sort of, although we, we, have, we have it in us, as you have said. And then I think this public art agency action to, instead of letting someone else doing this critique of this Jung and Wagner work, they sort of made that montage themselves to make sure that the connection is nature and nothing else. To sort of, and, and that was also sort of disabling uh, the critique of the montage in, in a way. Uh, so I was just wondering if you could sort of say something about that sort of um, how works are uh, restrained from each other or connected to sort of disable certain connections or, uh, or certain imaginaries uh, and cov cover others and feed others, yeah. if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> yeah, it's a question of, you know, the national, national imagination. It's a question, obviously, of uh, self-identity. Self and we, in different cultures around the world, build our identities based on, very often, uh, the histories that are told to, or taught to us and, um, yeah, the artifacts and objects which are around us, which, which form the kind of like, you know, origin story of the place that we, that we are. And that origin story we are discovering in our generation, or in ours and the, and the one just before us, is, is sort of patently false. But I guess we're trying to figure out what exactly, not what the real story is, because that's not actually the, what, we're, what the question is. It's more like, how is it, how does something we've always been told is, that is vertical or linear, how do we now uh, sort of feel that as something which is horizontal, you know, something which is um, more democratic in that sense of, of like similar stories in different parts of the world being, um, Building up, building up to to how we see ourselves now, and I guess here in this particular culture, there's quite a specific um, shift that took place, I suppose, within the in in the middle of the early to middle 20th century, where Sweden, I suppose, was one of many different European powers of different size who took part in the in the in the you know had colonial interests, let's say, um, but took this idea of uh, solidarity and the building of a folk hemet um, and shifted the, the guilt which would have been coming um, or the sort of implication in this history away from from the country and like shifted it out of the story that, that uh, we are told. And so when I think about, when I talk about national imagination, I'm thinking about how to start sort of infecting that sphere with something which is, which will grow and ferment and become something more than, you know, the, more than what, what is assumed or what is like seen as being a yeah, direct lineage to any to anything really. Sorry for that roundabout answer. Yeah. yeah, I was I was thinking like while you were talking as well, um, and on your question about how um, this idea of of um, movement works and people work, because I th I believe they're made in in a sense with with a, a people in mind, um, and that they operate like directed towards people. But then people have been moving for so much like throughout history, and and people in Sweden have changed and and memories or histories are, oh, sorry, I get this right. Um, yeah, I was thinking like 
how in the early in the early 1900s, like public art was so important in creating this kind of um, national history because it was important to have it just then um, because of the industrialization to create kind of like the significant space um, and then how those national figures became like Engel, Engel Brechtson and all these characters that only a few of us know who are and images and stories that are that we don't hear when we grow up in our homes and et cetera, et cetera. Like society has completely changed, but ha was also quite different during those times as well. But how now we also have to deal within, with that as like, we have institutions called national museums when um, Sweden as a nation is not as, uh, as um, homogen homogenous. homogenous? as it was probably uh, before, and how like all national museums are built on this idea of nation and nationhood, and nationhood is not an old concept, it's a new concept, as you said, like borders were more fluid before, and then this idea of nationhood is based on people, a certain specific types of people, and Sweden has always uh, been there's always been people from other cultures within Sweden. Um, so, for example, Torgbrunnen, the boy, is supposed to be the depiction of Bad Kuchi, called Badin, who lived in Sweden for a long time, like a long time ago, uh, and was like non, not Swedish. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think we have a responsibility, really, not to sort of just point out uh, what has gone wrong, but to just be proactive in sort of like broadening the conversations and uh, being, yeah, we, we do operate in this, in this complex um, structure within this field where we, we have the potential, we have the potency of images you know, and of stories. That's mm. things mm -hmm. that we deal with quite a lot. And, and we need to see what has come before and um, yeah, I think make sense of it differently, but also like, yeah, move forward. Yeah, because I think it's a lot about narratives. Yeah. That's what I try to mm. get at. That there are different narratives happening and, and, and if we try to think or broaden um, the historical narrative that we have of um, of this of Sweden or just here, um, that would be an approach towards something or somewhere else, yeah. like how to yeah. deal with it somehow. It's it's like a it's a it's a weird <laughs> fact. I feel like. Um, that we live in a time when images can travel, you know, so fast that it's almost happening in real time. So images can move around the world um, as quickly as, as, as they can get to a satellite and back down. But in terms of the movement of people, we really haven't gotten much past, you know, the speed of the steamship, basically. Like, we're still back in the early 20th century in terms of how easily people can move across borders or, or across, across oceans. And, you know, and, uh, but I, I think there is some potential in the fact that we, as I said, do work with images, that we can um, break down pre-existing narratives and start to uh, bring other ones into play, which hopefully um, have an effect on the on the on the on the conceptions of how and why bodies aren't allowed across borders as easily as images of those bodies, let's say. Other questions? Well, follow up. No, 
not trying to steal the word, but, but really just short, then how do we deal with this kind of new liberal way to take responsibility that Staten's Konstort Public Art Agency imagines that they do when they insist on this kind of dialogue, sort of medborgar dialog, which we also experience outside of the field of culture, this kind of almost performance way of taking this seriously and being critical, almost, although it's like actually the opposite of being critical. Have you seen this, um, that kind of method appearing elsewhere and how do we kind of deal with that enemy that is much more, let's say, fluid and smart and, and really present these days, also in academies and uh, at places that many of us work and so on? You, you mean sort of the impotency of dialogue or the, the way that it absorbs? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, again, I think it probably has to do with uh, questioning who it is uh, taking part in the dialogues or like changing that, changing the makeup of the people who have the the position or, or power to make decisions about that. Mm. I was immediately thinking of, um, um, there's this kind of, I get totally what you mean, but I, I don't, I don't want to name names. Um, uh, there's this idea of like feeding on dialogue. So you do, you're basically an institution, you send people to, let's say, vulnerable, parts of the city to have dialogue and then you're supposed to take that conversation and bring them and change what you're doing but essentially who's getting paid um, it's not the people who sit there and have the dialogue that basically feed you information for what you're gonna do and it looks good on paper because it's look we collaborated with the communities we're making something um, that they want or uh, that, I, that they asked for, but they're doing all the work. You're positioning yourself as a kind of holy mediator of those things. So I think it's again like agency. It's not even dialogue. Like we can talk all that we want, but who has agency to do something about it? Yeah, I mean, in a way, I think we maybe overestimate um, as artists, the, the amount of, like, we overestimate what, how what we do affects or causes real change in society. I mean, I think very often we don't acknowledge enough the fact that we do ourselves, less so than elsewhere, but less so here than elsewhere, but we do operate within, um, yeah, within a sort of, like, no, I, not corrupt, but a, a capitalist field, basically a field which is all which is about, which is which is based on on on, yeah, on money and profit and so on, and we. It's yeah, like artistic practice is not social social justice, and it's a mistake, I think quite a few artists make, uh, to sort of think that what they're doing is is enacting that. Um, in, in a real sense. But I think that, that both have value in and of themselves, and I think there, is, there needs to be space for the interplay between the two. But I think this thing where an artist like takes the kind of like uh, framework or, or I, I aesthetic of social justice movements and produces artwork with, with that aesthetic is is not effective at all but i i'm on the other hand i'm all for making work which absorbs what is happening um in society and um is presented as you know like effective art objects and at the same time working really hard to shift just as a human being as like a member of society um uh, not shift but sort of acknowledge the 
um, privileges that we have and the and point to the ones that we don't have and just like keep on fighting in that sense as well and keep on keep keep on being realistic about what it is we do and how we can sort of like um, yeah shift things in both realms let's say Any more questions? Okay. Oh, sorry. I could have a last one. Um, thank you very much for your talk. I'm just interested in, uh, like, in general, how do you think that uh, Sweden has reacted on the Black Lives Matter movement? And then I mean, like, cultural institutions, politicians, have the reactions, yeah, I mean, how, what have they been, what should they have been? I mean, I'm, for example, compared to this, um, there was an uprop, what's the word in English, um, from uh, 40 journalists at the Swedish radio today who said that, for example, after Me Too, there was like a big, uh, a reaction and you were talking about okay how should we change our work what could you do and what have we done wrong uh, and claimed it hasn't been the same at all with black lives matter and why wasn't the reaction as big now um, what's your perception of this thank you i haven't seen any change um no I haven't seen any, I haven't experienced any change in the way that people treat me in shops when I'm followed around or whatever, you know. No. Um, it maybe has to do with where I live or something like that, but I genuinely felt no, felt no. I mean, I guess what I, one thing I did feel extremely strongly was completely enraged by um, all the hashtags that were all over social media when that was first happening in, you know, after the killings in the summer in the US. Because it's, it operates in the same way that I feel like, I feel like uh, political solidarity is something which has a place, but is, but is one becomes over-reliant on, on the idea of solidarity. Solidarity, especially in, in, the, in the sort of social media realm, does nothing. In, in, it has no real world impact. And um, social media can be used in, in very positive and active ways in terms of uh, you know, conversations and, and getting people out into the streets and so on. But for me to scroll through a feed on social media and see all of these people sort of like putting up fist symbols and so on, and then just like going back to their lives, or it, it felt like there was this summer a potential for something to shift, something to change, because you know it's one of these moments where uh, history accelerates and um, things can happen. But even then, even in that moment when I saw that what was happening was um, everybody, at least in, in, in my feed, let's say, um, expressing solidarity on, um, online, and nothing more. I knew even then nothing would happen. You know, so it's a it's a it's a fight that goes on, and it's not a fight that we have any allies with. I feel. Yeah, yeah. We talk about like solidarity as a shield, yeah. um, and also it's very like image based as well. But with cult within like the cultural sphere or field, I'm. It's not that much engagement, there hasn't been a lot of change. People have been kind of blasé about it, I would say. Um, some inst institution, they hide behind these kind of like constituted press releases, lives like, okay, uh, the institutions is working this way and that way with like inclu being multiculturally inclusive and against this discrimination as if they're just putting up some principles that they follow um, without acknowledging the reality of the situation. Um, so no, I haven't seen any changes at all. I mean, we should acknowledge that the two of us are sitting here, I suppose. 
and yeah. uh, discussing this. <laughs> I guess that is a change. <laughs> <laughs> We're not, I'm not in charge of any institution, but uh, I'll keep screaming. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you so much for having us. Um, thank you. Yeah.